Welcome back to Adventures in Blockchain. So I'm Gregory from DAP University, and I've got my co-panelists here, Roman and Bruno, to talk about a very exciting topic today, one that um, drew me into blockchain development in the first place. Um, and that topic's going to be how to earn passive income as a blockchain developer. So I'm excited to talk about this. I've got Roman here today uh, to kind of talk about some of his experience doing this, earning passive income as a blockchain developer. And I've got, you know, some things to weigh in on as well. And yeah, I'm really excited. So let's get started. Uh, first and foremost, hey, Roman. Hey, Bruno, how are you guys doing? Doing great. Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's, this is Roman. I'm very excited for today's episode. Uh, I think we're going to cover a lot of great topics, such as uh, what is like running a validator nodes on various networks. So it's going to be really a uh, great topic. Awesome. Hey, everyone. This is Bruno. Um, yeah, feeling great about the episode today. I have a lot of questions about this one. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So don't let uh, the vocabulary words and the questions scare you all away. We're going to explain everything, um, you know, kind of how you can do this, how you can get into blockchain with the uh, kind of idea of building passive income as a developer rather than having to, you know, earn every dollar uh, by working for somebody else. All right. So, the first thing I want to talk about, there's lots of ways to do this, right? And, and the first thing we're going to talk about is actually building applications um, that will earn you passive income on the blockchain, okay? So if you're talking about, you know, blockchain-based applications, you know, there's this, there's this term, you know, DAP or DAP, depending on how you want to say it, basically stands for distributed application or decentralized application. And a lot of times these are applications that are powered by smart contracts that run on the blockchain, right? And in the cases of many blockchain networks, you know, particularly, um, particularly on the Ethereum network, which is, you know, the blockchain I primarily focus on, um, a lot of the use cases surround financial transactions, right? You're just sending some cryptocurrency, some ether uh, to a smart contract with, to another person, or you're having to pay for gas fees anytime you actually interact with the application itself, all right? And so whenever you're doing this, you're opening up the opportunity for a developer to build in a fee structure, right? Or some sort of way to, to, you know, take a cut of any money that's spent in the application or for certain features in the application or something like that. Okay. And that's one way um, the developers can come in and create, um, you know, apps that will earn you money that can just literally sit back and run themselves on this blockchain network. You don't even have to do necessarily do any code updates to these smart contracts if they're not upgradable, things like that. Right. So, I'm going to ask Roman, uh, who's actually done a really good job with this. Okay. And he's going to talk about his uh, particular DAP, or he's probably going to call it a D app. <laughs> um, so Roman, tell us about your experience with this. Sure. So I've been running a few D apps uh, that are trying to follow a traditional business model without any external funding, uh, because I don't, I just, I'm really like lazy in terms of like how to rent, raise funds and all of that because I'm just a developer. I'm not a finance guy. I really don't know how to do all of that. And I, I just enjoy programming. And sometimes I would see an opportunity and I would try to take it and implement a very simple uh, economic model where I would charge a very small fee for the service. So for example, one of the apps that I have is called multisender.app. Uh, what, what it basically does is to, it, um, it helps people to uh, launch an airdrop. Uh, airdrop is the process where you have some token and you want to send this token to a lot of addresses. So some people view it as a spam. And uh, some people, let's say, uh, if you're an investor, like or you, you're a manager of, of some uh, crypto fund, and uh, you constantly have to like distribute your uh, like tokens to your uh, investors, I mean, contributors, or I mean, I don't know. There are so many people who is using Mojo Center, so I don't even know all of the customers and what kind of use cases they have. But the idea is very simple. You have a token, you have a list of recipients, and you want to send like, let's say 1,000 
token transfers in a, in a few clicks. That's what basically Multisender does. And for every badge, I charge a very small fee in, in Ethereum currency. So it's very convenient that like the, the Ethereum network, it all, it's sort of, it already has everything for you to just start building an apps and making money basically. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty <laughs> crazy. So just you know, for clarification, you know, this app, basically what it does is if you have your own cryptocurrency that you can distribute, right? You, you control in some sense, you have a lot of it, right? Necessarily. And uh, you want to send this to a lot of different people. You can just talk to Roman's app and basically blast out cryptocurrency to, you know, massive lists of people, right? Correct. Yes. Um, and then yeah. you take a cut anytime that happens. <laughs> right. Like very small cut. Like it's not a lot. I mean, yeah, like a couple, couple like 0 0.02 ether for every batch that, that the process. Yeah, totally. But I mean, this is, a, this is a huge value add for the person who wants to do it, right? I mean, imagine how painful this would be if you had a thousand people, right? You know, like wh wh how would you have to do it if you didn't use your app, Roman? <laughs> Sure. So um, personally, I've been doing it before myself with, when some clients will, will ask me like to do it. And I noticed that like there was no like a simple solution that uh, so far like non-technical people would be able to do. It. And um, like traditionally people just write their own like little backend script or something like that uh, you would have you have to be like a developer to write it you have to understand how ethereum blockchain works and it's just sort of uh, like it's very limited who can who, who is able to do it because some non-technical people i heard some stories that they would literally uh go through the list of recipients and manually send each transaction using, <laughs> using any some sort of ui wallet like trust wallet or uh metamask yeah and how much does that cost <laughs> yeah it's very painful like it's hard it was very painful to see like for me that what they do they would like spend a few hours just to do this manual work when they, they copy the address and paste it and click send that's not how it should be so that's why i build a multi sender yeah, totally. That's awesome. And this is, you know, kind of what I want to uh, highlight here is there's a clear value proposition for the user, right? They get to they get to save themselves a ton of time and, you know, in the process, pay you a relatively small amount to, you know, save that time for them and that pain, that headache, uh, you, you know, and it, this is a case where someone's clearly going to spend money to do this and they're already literally transferring money. Right. And that's another thing I want to highlight is there's so much opportunity for, you know, passive income earning as a blockchain developer, because people are getting on the blockchain to spend money in the first place. And when people are spending money to do things, they're used to paying fees, right? They're used to paying fees for services that move money around, right? For sure. And uh, another uh, great use case that is uh, ran by my uh, friends is called One Inch Exchange. And uh, I think the idea is also very great. They, they hit a spot that uh, basically what the app does, uh, let's say if you want to use the sum of the decentralized exchange to like exchange one, one token to another token, and uh, there are a few examples like Kyber Network, Bancor, uh, Uniswap Exchange. What those people done at One Inch Exchange is that they they were able like since it's all smart contracts, all these decentralized exchanges, and you can basically publicly query the whole data. So what they come up if let's say you want to make a trade. Uh, they query all those blockchains and in one transaction, they provide you more efficient uh, price, pricing algorithm by just selling small amounts to each exchange. So you get more tokens for the trade instead of if you just go to one particular decentralized exchange and make that sort of trade. Yeah, totally. That's awesome. And are they able to charge a fee that would, you know, still... Uh it, like, do, so do they charge fees for this? Maybe it's the first question. 
Um, I think so, but I'm not 100% sure. Maybe yes, maybe no, but I, I think this model el would also be ideal to charge a very small percentage because the customer still benefits. Yeah, exactly. And that's yeah. kind of what I was going to go with. You know, if, if they don't charge a fee, I could, I could still see this business model working where, you know, they're able to still save you money in the long run and get their fee. It's a win-win. Right. And I think the, the first uh, wave of such application where people would make money is, let's say, during the 2017 year, people would make a D app where you can easily launch your token or ICO contract. And that that business model was massive, like people were making so much money just on this simple idea. Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah, um, just going back a little bit, um, in both of these apps that you mentioned, Roman, um, I'm just wondering about like the process for like wallets, because I know that sending money to um, like via the blockchain, you need a wallet, right? Um, right. So say, for example, I have my own, um, I don't know, whatever coin wallet. Um, okay. Do I need to create a wallet on your apps to send the money to other wallets or can I like unify, unify all of my wallets into one? How does the walleting work in that scenario? Yeah, that's a great question, I think. Uh, so initially I was focusing only on uh, Ethereum blockchain and providing support only to Ethereum blockchain. And uh Ethereum has a like great ecosystem of various wallets and all sorts of things. So I didn't have to build a wallet. I was simply like just working uh, as a decentralized application via Web3 uh, Web3 object. So what it means is that I don't have to build a wallet, and any Web3 compatible wallet uh, is like is already like. Web3 compatible like browser can actually already work with my D app like any other D apps on the Ethereum chain. And recently I came up with the idea that I can actually write a multi center for any sort of blockchain. And the first use case that I just uh, already um, already built is a multi center for Algorand chain. And the concept that I used a little bit different concept, but I realized the pattern that I create that that I made. I mean, it's very simple, and it could be used for any any blockchain. Basically, uh, what it does is collects the addresses and balances. It validates all your data, calculates how much token you want to send, and I basically generate a private key on your. Um, inside of your browser. So it's it's like a, it's just a temporary key that you would use to like issue your airdrop. So I create a key, you need to send some balance to this key, click the ba click a button and that, that's pretty much it. So you can use any wallet to do that. And it, yes, you do need a wallet, like some sort of wallet where you store your funds, right? So you can, mm -hmm transfers the funds to to your temporary account that only you know, and it's only available to you. Uh, it's sort of like, if you remember like early days of uh, my Ether wallet, where you were able to create your wallet inside of the browser with a private key presented to you. Okay, so putting it in sort of like um, simple terms, I, I guess. Um, one thing that I can sort of like say that it would be sort of similar is when you create those virtual credit cards, right? Is it a one use wallet that is created, not wallet, but you know, like a one use key or account that is created on your browser to be able to send all of those transactions at once? Is that sort of the, the concept? Yeah, that's the that's a new concept that I came up for Algorand chain for Ethereum, for example. Yes, I, I work with uh, both ways. If, if you already have a free compatible uh, browser, mm, okay. I just use the account from that. 
uh, provider and uh, I don't store any private keys. I don't have any access to that. And mm. you simply use the application with a, with a full confidence that, you know, your funds are safe and you don't, you don't have to worry about that. Awesome. With, a second, with a second approach, when I pre-generate a private key for you and you have to send it, um, it's probably a little bit uh, not 100% secure in terms of like your personal level of confidence because you have to send some funds to some key that is, you know, you don't know whether like, let's say, do I store this key or not? And uh, of course, I'm going to say, no, yes, I, I don't I don't store any of these keys. But some of the users might think that I, I do have access to their keys and that could be an issue. And because right, right. You, you can just say something that you don't store the keys, you have to prove that you don't store. And the only way to prove it is to build the architecture or solution that would be, you know, like bulletproof that, yeah, that's, that's, you can't possibly have any keys. Right. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but right now users care about simplicity and uh, I would say right now I see some new wave of applications where people are realizing that it's, it's okay to be maybe a little bit centralized or maybe not, not much decentralization towards to better user experience. Yeah, totally. And we talked a little bit about that actually in our last episode where we had our guests on the channel of um, kind of uh, these two different extremes, right? Full decentralization as far as you can possibly go and then, you know, complete centralization on the other end of the spectrum. And, um, you know, in order to get people on board who are less used to the blockchain ecosystem, maybe it seems like there's a sweet spot, so to speak, uh, in between these things, heavily on the, on the side of decentralization, but, you know, maybe moving the dial a little bit back towards centralization in areas that we're okay to compromise on. Right. Yeah. So do we want to jump onto validation services? Yes, totally, totally. So what I want to talk about now is another way to earn passive income as a blockchain developer. And I suppose you don't even necessarily have to be a developer to take advantage of this, but um, developers are certainly going to uh, feel more at home uh, in this process. Okay. So we talked about, you know, way number one was to basically build an app that charges fees. Um, and way number two is going to be, um, participate in running a blockchain network. Okay. So, when Bitcoin, you know, first came out and for, you know, even a good while after that, and also Ethereum and others, um, it, there was this opportunity to become a miner, right? You hear, heard about this a lot. You might've seen tons of YouTube videos floating around, like, you know, might, might've seen it, you know, fly on the Google search rankings, like how to become a Bitcoin miner, right? People saw this opportunity to get rich by participating in running the Bitcoin network. And a lot of people did get rich doing this, right? Um, people did the same thing with Ethereum when it first came out, right? They participated in becoming miners on the network, right? So I'll just explain for two seconds, like what a miner is in case you're unfamiliar uh, and why there was such an opportunity here. Right. So miners, you know, you know a blockchain is as a distributed network, right? It's like a network um, that's run by computers all over the world. And certain people are responsible for running those computers. Right. And for proof of work blockchains, which is a consensus algorithm that Bitcoin uses and Ethereum still uses. Um, a certain a subset of the people who run the network are also miners, okay? And the job of the miners are essentially to uh, create new records on the blockchain that get included in the blocks, right? And then they're all like competing to solve these cryptographic puzzles and be like the first person who does it and it's competitive and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, but basically like, it, it, for Bitcoin, for example, anytime, you know, you'd send Bitcoin on the, on the Bitcoin network, um, a miner is going to be responsible for finalizing that transaction essentially or writing it to the blockchain and they get a reward for doing that. They get paid. All right. And that was some, one of the initial gold rushes in Bitcoin is you could just become a miner and earn Bitcoin. Same thing with Ethereum um, and other proof of work blockchains as well. Right. 
So we're seeing a shift um, to other blockchain using a new consensus mechanism, or sorry, a new consensus algorithm uh, called proof of stake and also others um, that use a different kind of, um, it, it, they don't have miners anymore. They have these things called validators, all right? And that's where I wanna bring Roman in to talk about that. So basically, yeah, um, validators businesses started, uh, I guess from like the, proof of work algorithms such as uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and all other uh, popular blockchains. Um, and right now, we, everybody realized the problem that they have to come up with something better, something more scalable, more efficient algorithm. And a uh, few of them would be proof of authority, delegated proof of stake and proof of stake. Uh, what what it requires for all of them is that someone has to run a validator's node. Uh, the validator node is like a is like a main main uh, like a component in this whole system that is required to to produce the healthy blockchain. So you, like the and the, the nodes. Uh, it's called like a, th there are some networks that w you have a trusted nodes and there, there are some networks that it doesn't matter what kind of node it's a tr trusted trustless node because the software itself verifies all the data that is coming from the node so in order to like trust it or not trust it so for example in proof of authority uh, networks uh, people have to trust the nodes because the, the authorities are able to they just authorize and say, yeah, this is the new block and I, I validate this new block and get a reward for that. There are a few proof of author public proof of authority networks. For example, Facebook Libra uh, project is also, um, is also proof of authority network. I mean, with a proof of authority consensus mechanism behind it, where they are able to issue like issue a new blockchain network with like 28 or like 100 uh, companies that are going to run validator nodes and get rewarded for, let's say, there are, there are a few types of rewards for every validator to be made. And one of them, some networks provide block rewards it just basically means if you run a node, you produce a block, you get rewarded. And another way to earn some income uh, is would be from transaction fees. In case of Facebook Libra's project, I guess the income would be uh, very interesting uh, because <laughs> the, the Libra network it's not a it's not a like it's not a volatile cryptocurrency. It's a stable coin, which is, you know, on a stable coin, you, you cannot make money by speculating on the price of the currency. However, <coughs> they do have a transaction fees. And I think running a node where like 6 billion people are using the network, the transaction fees could be massive. I mean, in terms of income. And it still would be profitable, usable, comparing to, let's say, uh, Visa or MasterCard uh, to like send a transaction because a fee would be much lower. Okay, and that's the future case. We don't even know yet and we don't even know like how Libra network is going to launch. But right now there are existing networks where you can become a validator and join uh, this new opportunity to earn a passive income. Uh, there are networks where you can publicly apply or talk to the team and ask like a questions like how you can become a validator, what would be the incentive mechanism in the networks. So for example, there are popular and top networks where it's already really, really hard to become a validator such as uh, EOS, um, <clears throat> Tezos, uh, Cosmos, because those networks are already established and there is a lot of uh, th there is a lot of like upfront cost you have to spend in order to become a validator so it's not going to be very easy for like you know 
uh, normal people like with a, not a lot of money to start to join the network and become a validator. So I think the opportunity right now is to be on a lookout for new networks and join to be a validator for not so popular networks. So maybe if they, you know, if they, if they do make it, you're gonna, uh, you're also gonna make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, so it's, it's this very exciting uh, opportunity for especially technical people, you know, like the, the cryptocurrency speculation world um, can get really crazy, right? And here's a, here's a way for you to maybe uh, do something different that has a similar upside and you're going to have a, a distinct advantage with. Correct. And uh, there are some other interesting use cases that I've seen. For example, let's say you don't have a lot of uh, access to capital, but you are really great, let's say, um, network engineer, you understand how to like run a, run a, some, you know, remote instances of software in a very, very secure ma manner. And what the opportunity for you is that you can sell your services to all the existing validators to say like you can audit their system or you can provide them the framework that is gonna be um, you know, protect, protected from various, let's say, DDoS attacks or exposing some of the vulnerable data to potential hackers. And those, I think, in a high demand right now for any blockchain network. And uh, another way would be if you can run a validator node and you're really great at marketing yourself so that you can attract people with, uh, with capital to, to earn income when they delegate funds to you. So what do I mean by that? Uh, I'm referring to a consensus called delegated proof of stake. It's basically where there are some set of nodes and uh, th there is a there is a voting power so voting power means how much other stake was delegated to you by uh, people from the from the outside from non validators from regular uh, wallets what it means is that some rich people who have a lot of stake in the network they i mean not rich and not rich i mean all kinds of people they um, they delegated some funds to some validator nodes in order for them to earn income. And you, as a validator, you can also charge a small percentage from the stake that has been delegated to you. That's, that's kind of it. I know it might sound very complicated and confusing right now because it's not very easy to process what, what delegation is, what validation is, and you might be very confused. So. I would highly encourage you to spend some time maybe like on Google, YouTube to read more about it because every network has also like different rules, how they run their network, how they reward validators. So it's not like one case works for all of them. No, it's not. You have to do the research for each network in particular. If you're, let's say, interested in Cosmos, there are some also slashing conditions that you have to consider when you run a node because you might lose money and you might lose money all for people who who is delegating funds to your node. And there are networks like POA network where uh, you basically, if you were chosen to be a validator, you can apply to be a validator and validators vote you in to the network then you simply run a note and get some rewards. Like it's not, it's not a big rewards, like very tiny rewards, uh, but still it's, it's a little bit profitable and fun just to run a note and like have this sort of passive income. And for example, recently there is a network called Chainlink, which uh, skyrocketed in price and uh, every, everyone who were, uh, who were a validator there, I think they made uh, pretty good profits in this network. And 
And again, as I said before, you never know what's going to happen. So you have to kind of invest your time in research and be able to push it forward. And I know like in the beginning, it all seems kind of um, like, weird like why do i have to, why do i want to spend some computational like let's say like 40 or 100 bucks on aws or digital option to just run some validator node that is not generating any income that's how it all starts you you have to do you have to go through this process where you don't even know what would be like a real incentive to run a validator node it's sort of your investment that this might work in terms of uh, financial income, or it may not work. If the network fails, the founders, like, you know, they, they don't know how to run it or they don't know how to promote it. It's a, it's a, I would say it's a very low F, I mean, not a, yeah, you have to do it. So it's like a full-time job, yes, for some people to just research every network and figure out how to run the validator or not and uh, connect all the necessary pieces and make it happen. But once you've done it once, it's much easier to just um, to to add like more networks to your like uh, to your validation service. Yeah, totally. That's awesome. Yeah, Roman, I think that pretty much covers it. And I, yeah, I think you're right. You know, there, it, this can be a little bit of a brain bender when you're first getting into it, right? It can be a little confusing. There's some concepts that you have to chew on and digest slowly, but the upside can definitely be worth it, right? You're getting here to learn how this stuff works. Um, you know, like I said, there's a good amount of speculation involved, uh, but it's a way for you to get in on the speculative side of the blockchain industry without having to, you know, sink a bunch of money into cryptocurrency, which you you also have very little control over. <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Well, um, guys, I think that is pretty, uh, pretty good for today. Bruno, did you have any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I um I just kind of have one small question about the validation and validators process. Um you said that you have to run a node to you know provide a validator or a validation. Um what do you mean by node? Is it like a um AWS instance or can I do it in my laptop? Do I need to install a program for that? How does running a node uh, you know, what does it mean? <laughs> yeah, it, the process looks very similar to run some sort of web server or web application where you have to, um, like your node has to be able to connect to other nodes. Uh, it's uh, every blockchain network is the peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, so yeah, the, so the, this, the process is very, very similar to running any kind of uh, web service on their backend. Got it. Right. And um, you said that there are some networks that are more expensive to run to run nodes, and some networks are cheaper. Um, is that because of uh, you know traffic and hardware limitations? <laughs> Uh, mostly is because the barrier to entry, let's say, from, uh, let's say there, there is like a network and there is a, a fixed number of how many validator can be in that network, let's say 21 validator. And you can already see to get onto 21st place, you have to be able to have, let's say, 10 millions of dollars already delegated to your node in order to to be like uh, to participate in an active validator set because there is a like an inactive validator set that validated they don't reach some sort of criteria to be in the, the active validator set. So a lot of that is just involves how much money, uh, how much capital you can attract to your node from outsiders. Awesome. So it's like, does that work the same for all of the networks? Is it sort of like a... No, no, no. Every network is uh, has a different... For, for example, EOS has also a very uh, large hardware um, requirement. So you have to run uh, like a 
massive hardware uh, infrastructure and to pay a lot of money for hardware course, not to mention how much money you should have from like marketing uh, effort, like marketing, I mean, when you, when you like market your notes, so people will delegate money to your notes. Yeah. And, and one thing you have to, to consider as well is the electricity cost of all of it, right? <laughs> no, no, not, not at all. Because no? no, not at all. Because you have to realize what I'm, when I talk about validator services, I do not mean uh, proof of work. Proof of okay. only proof of work requires you to think about your hardware infrastructure, and it's all about hashing power, like okay. how many how many hashes per second your infrastructure can generate. And the, the more and robust hardware you have, the more uh, hashes per second you can generate. Therefore, you have to watch out for electricity bills. What I'm talking about today, like, is the validation uh, like services. And mostly mean it's a proof of stake, delegated proof of stake, and proof of authority. Those consensus they do not require um, uh, like intensive like electricity power or anything like that. Those those uh, validator nodes could be ran on a laptop just fine. But I, of course, like in order to have a reliable node you should probably use some cloud hosting providers or even the data centers like to like rent rent some space in a data center for more uh, secure setup with uh, uh, HSM hardware security module connected to that node. That's like a next level of, I mean, not a next level, it's been traditional level of security for uh, large traditional uh, infrastructures. Awesome. Yeah. Like you said, it, it sort of sounds very similar to running uh, a web server, for example. You know, it's not totally. something really hardware intensive, you know, but you need it to be reliable, right? You need it to be up there running and, you know, validating everything. Yeah, and what I one thing I want to tell everyone and to encourage everyone to try it is that you you it's not that hard to start to start it. Even if you don't if you're not an expert in network security and you know running some nodes on the service, just give it a try, see how it works. And uh, the every network has its own test nets. Testnet is the like network with a fake currency. So you're not going to lose any money, even if you do something wrong. And during that process, you will learn a ton of very valuable and useful information how a blockchain works. So I would highly encourage you to participate in some network that you like and uh, try to run the nodes and understand how they're uh, infrastructure works. Awesome. Yeah, very cool. All right, guys. Well, um, I think that's going to wrap us up for today. Um, so I hope you all really liked this episode again. You know, there's a lot of opportunity in the blockchain space to earn money, earn passive income even as a, as a developer, right? From building your own applications that charge fees um, to running the blockchain infrastructure itself. And there's lots of other ways. I mean, we didn't really get into everything today. Um, but yeah, I hope you all found this interesting. We're going to put some, you know, resources links uh, in the video description uh, for you all to check out as well. Um, so yeah, until next time, thanks for listening to Adventures in Blockchain. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E 